Hello, everybody. Dr. Rick Wallace dropping in on you uh, this late morning. I know that I've been away. A uh, lot's going on. Remember, we're trying to get uh, my 21st book to print. And of course, uh, closing out is always a challenge because you're trying to make sure all your bases are covered. You're trying to make sure that uh, you're not going to have uh, post-published print issues because of the formatting. Uh, you're trying to make sure all of your content editing is on point. You're trying to make sure that the graphics are going to be something that you can uh, uh, be proud of. And so we're taking a couple of weeks longer than we wanted to, but I'm happy with the product that we're putting out. Um, so we're doing that. And you can still pre-order that book and get the discount and get the free one-on-one -on -one session with yours truly. Uh, so I just want to get that out of the way. But I'm, I'm here today. Uh, we're going to talk about something that's immensely powerful, something real simple that at the end of the at the end of the day, when you take a look at this and you can practice it, you can put it into practice. I uh, posted something uh, a little earlier uh, on Facebook, and it was that one of the biggest problems we have in this culture is that common sense isn't always common practice. And that's a problem. A lot of people know things, but very few people are putting those things they know into practice on a consistent basis. And with that, when, when that happens, you have inconsistency in results. Uh, you have uh, chaos. You have diminishing uh, returns and so much more that works against you. Uh, you have to take the things that are common knowledge, things that you just simply know should be done, and you have to practice them. Uh, simply knowing them, you know, that's why you've got people who are unbelievable at giving advice, but terrible at actually taking their own advice. And I see that in my profession. I've suffered from it myself. It's easy to tell someone what you know they should be doing. It takes more work and consistency to actually put that into practice in your own life. And so that has to be a part of the dynamic. What I want to talk to you about here is a situation that is a growing and increasing issue uh, in today's world. And, it, it, and it's not uh, a, a geographical phenomenon. It's not something that's just happening in this city or in this state or in this country. It's a growing phenomenon around the world. As technology advances, we're seeing this become a problem. And that is uh, surrendering our personal sovereignty to our smart devices. And I'm going to show you how we do that. Um, now, in order to understand that, the thing is, uh, I was doing some research, you know, as I close out the book, you know, I'm doing research as I prepare to write the next one. And there, because remember, uh, starting with Critical Mass, which was my 20th book, that also began the first book, that was, that was also the first book in a six book series. Uh, I Am, which is the book that we're about to drop, is the second book in the series. So we're connecting these. They are growing. And so I'm doing research. And I came across this number that totally blew my mind. I know that it's an issue, but I didn't know how much of an issue it was. And I write about this all the time, but it totally blew my mind that we're at this point right now. The, the uh, simple statistic that caught my eye was that the average person opens their Instagram app a hundred and fifty times a day. Now that's the average person. That means there are some people out there opening their Instagram app more than that because there are people like me that might open their app uh, three times, four times a day, tops. Uh, because and people say, well, how do you handle all this stuff you post on all these different social media channels? So just to give you an idea, I have almost twenty Facebook pages that deal with the different things that I do. Uh, I have 20 Facebook pages. I have several Instagram accounts. I have about eight YouTube channels. Um, I, I have over 20 plus websites. And so people say, well, it seems like you would be on social media all day. Absolutely not. That's why a lot of people, you know, you've inboxed me on one of those pages and it's taken a while for me to get back to you is because I don't go on. I have uh, content management systems that allow me to post where I want to post, schedule those posts, compile those posts that I'm not necessarily posting at the time you see it posted. It might have been scheduled a week ago. It might have been scheduled yesterday. And even if I am posting it live, 
I'm not posting it on the actual platform. That allows me to do my work and not get caught on what this person posted, what that person posted, how this person responded to what I posted. And so it allows me to maintain a level of control and sovereignty over my day. Uh, so, but, you know, people are literally opening up there and there's a reason for it. These devices are designed to uh, cause dopamine releases and dopamine is a feel good hormone. It actually makes you feel good to open that up. There's a sense of reward when you open up your phone and you open up apps and whatever. The problem is so many people are now uh, subject to the suggestions of what they see and read on these devices and they're becoming more responsive and reactive instead of being more creative. Um, and I'm gonna give you a prime example of, example of where this happens most. It happens at the beginning, beginning, beginning of the day. How many people, be honest with yourself and be honest, how many people, the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is reach up and grab, grab your phone? And most of you make it even more easier for you to do that because your phone is your alarm. So you have to pick it up to turn the alarm off and then you just get to scrolling. Here's the problem with that. You have primarily four major core uh, brainwave states. Uh, you have uh, beta. Beta is the state that you're in now. You're awake, you're alive, you're awoke, you're aware. You, this is where your critical thought comes from. This is where your communication, this is where your decision making comes from. All of this is done in beta. So that, that's beta. Then you have delta. Delta is this deep sleep uh, where, you know, you can call it a dream state or whatever, but you're in a deep sleep. You're completely unaware of what's going on around you outside of what you may be encountering in your dream state. Then you have theta. And I've talked about theta a lot. Theta is this unbelievably powerful state that children up to, up to the age of five and seven are in almost constantly. It is a learning state. It is a state where you are constantly absorbing things. And, 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 and also these things are being inculcated into your mind because in theta you absorb. There's not a whole, the reason children are in theta almost all the time because there's not a whole lot of data or past experiences to shape new ideas or expectations. So when something is presented, there's not something from your past to say that can't be true uh, or, or that is not how it's done. So when you're teaching a kid that uh, hasn't reached the age of seven yet, you can suggest some astronomical phenomenal things and put those possibilities in their mind and they won't, they won't uh, resist it. They'll see it as possibility, and then you sculpt it and you give them an idea of how they go after it, and then they just start moving and believing. And once they pass seven, it's harder to disrupt what they've been taught and believe. And that's why you have people who are introduced with new ideas, but they can't embrace it because they're no longer in theta uh, the majority of the time. They're now functioning almost all the time if they're woke in beta, and their beta is always consulting their past. And when you're consulting your past to develop a, a, an understanding of what's possible based on what you're observing, then you start to live by these limit, limitations that are created in your mind through beliefs. So it's important. So theta is this state that you're in from about the last 30 minutes when you start to doze off and the first 15 minutes of the time, so somewhere up in there where you're waking up, but you're not completely, you're woke, but you're not completely awake. Alpha is a state that's created, it's almost like a trans -like state. People enter into alpha uh, when meditating. Uh, another place that you'll find people in alpha, uh, and I get fussed at all the time like that, is when watching TV, and that shows you just how powerful uh, a programming mechanism TV is. Have you ever seen somebody that's watching something that they're really, really into, or they really like, whether it's a guy in sports, a woman in watching some show she's really into, or whatever it is, and they're deep off into it, and they've been sitting there watching it for a minute, and you say something to them, and they don't respond. You say something again, and they don't respond. And you, you kind of feel like, hey, they're ignoring me. No they're in an alpha state. They're literally in a trance state where they're totally sucking up everything that's being presented on that screen. And that is a part of the programming process. The beautiful thing is you can control your programming. It doesn't have to happen when you're watching TV. 
and you can limit what you watch on TV. You can control all of that. So you're not a victim unless you just soak in whatever's thrown at you and you don't use your own personal sovereignty to determine what you're going to allow to be programmed in your, to your subconscious. So both of those states are achievable when you're we're first waking up and when you're going to sleep. So let's talk about waking up because this is where a great deal of the problem exists. So if you wake up and the first thing you do is reach for your phone, you're first of all training yourself to be distracted. Why? Because you're gonna go on there and whatever's on there is gonna take your mind off of what you should be doing uh, at the beginning of your day. And that should be a process, that should be a systematic process that you use to bring you into your day to give you the most control, the most focus, the most direction, and give you peak performance in every situation. And it's not surrendering your sovereignty to your device. Because here's what happens. First of all, you're trained to be distracted because whatever's on there is gonna get your attention. And then you start looking for things and then things will automatically distract you from what you're doing. That's why you're all over the place. But second is you surrender your sovereignty in that what, uh, when you run into something on your device that is not something you want, it is a negative thing. It can literally screw up your day. I see people all the time. When you open up that phone, especially at that moment, like you haven't set your state, you haven't set your state, you haven't established a heart of gratitude, you haven't established a course of action for the day, a plan of action for the day, an expectation uh, platform for the day. And so this first thing that you encounter is going to set your state of mind for the day. And if you get on there and somebody's uh, uh, disliked one of your videos or somebody just uh, text you and told you somebody you know passed away or something like this or the bill collectors or, or whatever. When you open that device, you're at the mercy of whatever is there that you don't control. Now it controls you, especially when you do it first thing in the morning. Why? Because you're either in alpha or theta and now you are open your subconscious up and it's powerful. So what it trains you in that moment is more emphatic than if you engage it later in the day. Why? Because you're in a state of learning and absorption and processing. And this is the time you want nothing but positive coming in. You want to set your positive. You got to come up with ways to do that. But when you sit up and the first thing you do is reach for that device. Now, keep in mind, this device is designed for you to pick it up. They want you to pick it up. They want you to scroll it. So what happens? Number one is, there's a couple of things. There's a thing called uh, the, the dopamine pop. And what happens is, every time you open that phone, scrap it up, you get a rush of dopamine. And you don't even realize it, but you've become addicted to it because you've become addicted to the feeling you get by releasing the dopamine and you pick the phone up and it, and, it, 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 and you gotta have it. it it's on the back, you're reaching for it, you're reaching for it. And, and, and it's going on all through the day until you do, you're doing more reaching than you are working and, and you gotta control it. Second of all, that's a thing called variable reward. And that means that every time you go to the phone, there's a different thing. It's not the same. See, if you got the same thing every time, even if it was positive, but it was the same thing every time, then it would become boring. But see, with your phone, you never know what you're going to get. So you open it, and, and, and you're hoping for something great. And even when it's positive or it's fun or whatever, it's bearable, so it keeps you coming back. So now you got a dopamine pop, you got variable reward, you got all this stuff that's coming at you that makes you want to pick that phone up. But the problem is you're surrendering your sovereignty. You're not setting your day, the phone is setting your day. If the phone is something good on it, you start out with a good day. Uh, but you're also training yourself to be distracted and be guided by what's on the phone. You're never in charge of your life, the phone is. So you have to wake up in the morning and establish who's in charge. And so what I've done, and what I've done for as far as I can remember, is the phone's off limits for the first hour. And I use it, I've gotten to where I can use it as my alarm. For a while, I wouldn't even have the phone in my reach. I, I had an alarm. But over the last maybe five, six years, I have the phone, it's the alarm, I turn around, hit the alarm, lay the phone down. I get up. First thing I do is I establish a heart of gratitude. That starts before I even get out of the bed. I start, I establish a heart of gratitude. I find these things that, at least three things that I have to be grateful for. That's one, always present because my wife sleeps next to me. 
And then I, I go on, I find three things to be grateful for. And then the next thing I do is I sit up and I establish my intent. And that's done by saying, okay, what are three things personally and professionally that I can do to make myself better today? So if nothing else goes right, if I get those three things done, I'm better. I'm improved. I've advanced. I've progressed. And see, life is about progress. Life is about growing into what you were designed to be. It's about expediting the process at every possible opportunity. And so what I'm doing is I'm sitting up and I'm waking up and I'm saying, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to establish a heart of gratitude. Why is that so important? When you establish a heart and a mindset of gratitude in which you set a state in which your primary focus is to be grateful, you can't whine, you can't complain, you can't quit. There's no negative flow, no negative energy anywhere near you when you set a heart of gratitude. All the things that bring you down cannot exist in a heart of gratitude, cannot exist in your periphery. You have established that good things are going to happen today because good things have already happened. I have something to be grateful for, so I am not going to complain. There are some challenges out there, but I'm designed for it. I'm built for this. I'm built for the battle. I am capable of overcoming anything I face. And so I'm going to wake up, I'm going to go out here, and I'm going to do something exceptional today. I'm going to help somebody be better. I'm going to help somebody feel better. I'm going to help somebody heal. I'm going to do something that leaves an imprint on this world that's positive, that's powerful. And I have the ability to do that each and every day. You don't have to do a whole bunch of big, huge, great things to achieve greatness. Greatness is best achieved when you do a bunch of small things consistently and in intensely to the point of trying to achieve excellence in it. It's not the big things. It's the small things, things that you have control of each and every day. So what, what am I saying? I'm saying, don't touch that phone. For me, it's an hour. I'm going to set my state I'm going by, of gratitude. Then I'm going to determine my path through intent. I'm going to establish exactly what it is that I am going to do today. What are three things that I can accomplish today as a person that's going to make me a better person? What are three things I can do that's going to make me a better business person, a better, uh, functional, more functional and more effective in what I do in my work? Three things. And it doesn't have to be anything huge. That's the whole thing. What you want to do is you want to advance. You want to progress. You want to get momentum started. And, and, and so you, you find the things you can do. Now, I've already set my state. I'm already... 100% uh, anchored in how I feel. By the time I get through with the hour, I'm no longer in theta. I'm no longer in alpha. And how I get into alpha is through meditation. Now in alpha, in meditation, that's where another place that you get in alpha, outside of the television, which is unless you've got some stuff you want to watch on television that's powerful, that's empowering, uh, that releases you into the universe, uh, stay away from the television as much as possible. Uh, I, I'm not telling you to stay away from it altogether because I don't, but I definitely monitor what um, I'm going to watch and how I'm going to interpret it and process it because three people can watch the same thing and get three totally different things from it. So I'm going to make sure if I'm going to watch it, how I'm going to process it. And, and so that's that. But another great powerful way to put yourself in a state of alpha is in the shower. Now, one thing that I do uh, when I go to the gym in the morning is I'm going to do my workout. And if I still feel sluggish after my workout, which I normally don't, I feel great normally after my workout, but if I'm still feeling sluggish, it's definitely if it's a mental fog. Then I get in the shower, I shower, take a normal shower. Then I take a five to 10 minute cold shower. And you will be surprised at what that does for your brain. It'll also uh get uh it'll also decrease inflammation in your joints uh inflammation flowing through uh your, your blood vessels your, your, your muscles it's going to get inflammation way down a cold shower is immensely powerful so what i do is i get in the shower i'm going to take a if i take a shower i'm gonna take a cold shower number one is because my body temperature normally is high anyway that's why i have to have it cool where i'm at and so um what happens is uh, I get in, I take the shower, then I turn on the cold. And I mean cold, and I get under it, and I just let it run. And I make sure it's flowing over my whole body, but definitely over my head. And it'll lift the fog. 
It's amazing. A cold shower first thing in the morning is awesome. I don't normally do mine first thing in the morning. I normally do it after a workout. But like if it's get really bad, I wake up and I, I, you know, I'm just in a fog. And we all do it. You wake up and you got to get your day started. I mean, like simple stuff like you can't find your shoes and your socks. You know, it's just one of those days. You can snap yourself out of it. You don't need a cup of coffee. You need a cold shower. And it, it, it does amazing things. Uh, so that's, that's another way that you do it. But what happens is by the time you get all of this done, you're out of theta, you're out of alpha. Now you're ready to take on the world because what you're going to experience is not going to have as much of a massive impact on you as if you're in theta or alpha. It's not going to be an establishing uh, force in how you move about your day. It's going to be something you take on and something you process. And so it's extremely important. But we have been trained and conditioned to pick up that phone and be governed by what we see when we open that phone. You know, if we don't get enough likes, if we don't get enough shares, if somebody comes on and has something negative to say on a comment, if we get some emails with some bad news, our day is just screwed. Why? Because you surrendered your sovereignty to your device and its content. Instead of sitting up taking control of your day and being in control of anything you encounter, then engaging what's on that phone so that you are in control. And the thing is, uh, there's a ton of empirical data, pragmatic and empirical data, that points to the fact that the people who are the happiest and most fulfilled are the people who work and understand and maintain control over their happiness. It's the people who are not looking outside of themselves for fulfillment, not looking outside of themselves for happiness, but looking inside of themselves and saying that all I need to be happy is in me. I mean, we've been trained to seek happiness elsewhere. And that means that we're surrendering our sovereignty and our happiness to someone else. Sometimes they deliver, sometimes they don't. One of the things that my wife and I discussed a long time ago, and we actually agree on, is that it's not my responsibility to make her happy. And it's her, not her responsibility to make me happy. To, it's my responsibility to ensure I'm happy. It's her responsibility to ensure she's happy. It's my responsibility to create the right environment so that she can be happy, but her happiness is her responsibility. And if she is not intent on being happy, that's absolutely nothing I can do to make her happy. Same here with me. If I'm intent on being unhappy, that's absolutely nothing my wife can do. If my identity is being unhappy, no amount of anything that anybody in this world could do is going to make me happy. Yet, if I decide that I'm going to be happy, there's nothing in this world nobody can do to stop me. We have surrendered so much of ourselves to the external forces in the world that we have absolutely no control over our lives. And that's not how life is meant to be lived. Life is meant to be lived with you having sovereignty over your life. You making decisions in your life that are going to benefit you. You making decisions that are going to advance you. You making decisions that are going to uh, exponentially increase your ability to positively affect other people. But when you sit up and you're constantly looking outside of yourself for somebody to make you happy, for somebody to make you feel good about who you are, then that creates a situation in which you have lost sovereignty, you have lost control. You are now hoping somebody does something that will make you feel better. Somebody does something that will make you feel loved. Somebody does something that will make you happy. You are the source of your state of existence in this world. You determine how you engage people. You determine how you interpret your challenges. See, the only difference between those who get on and win in this world and those who have a perpetual state of suffering is their perception of what they're engaging. The person who is the perpetual victim sees life as something that keeps happening to them. The person who always gets on isn't because they are experiencing less challenges and less struggles and less difficulty than the person who is always 
blaming the world. It's that they see that life isn't happening to them, that it's responding to them. They see that when they're not getting what they want, they have to shift in their thinking, shift in their behavior, shift in their expectations, and then something new comes. You can't be in a place of complete surrender and then expect to be able to dictate what's happening in your life. You are believing life is happening to you because you've thrown everything out and it's just waiting on something to come back in that you like. Take control of the reins of your sovereignty, your personal sovereignty. You dictate how you're going to engage every day. You dictate how you're going to process things as you come about it. You are going to determine whether you're going to live your life as a thermostat or a thermometer. Let me explain what I mean and then I'll be done. A thermometer simply measures the environment around it. In the most common way the thermometer is used, it's, it's used to gauge the temperature of the environment. It can't do anything about it. It just simply says, this is what's happening. And then this is what we've got to deal with. It has no ability whatsoever to change it. It's just a thermometer. And most people in our life, as thermometers, we sit up and whatever's happening in our life, we sense it, and then we respond with disdain, but we never attempt to change it. We're just going to live with it. We accept poverty as our lot in life. We accept suffering as our lot in life. We accept mediocre and mismanaged relationships as our lot in life. We accept being mishandled as our lot in life, and we never, ever choose to change the current environment. But a person that's a thermostat sits up and says that I can set my setting at any point I want to set it at, and I change the environment. See, when you think in the mindset of being a thermostat. If I don't like the current temperature, I change the setting and the setting will change the environment. I'm in control of my life. Stop surrendering your personal sovereignty. Take control of the reins of your life. Make a, a, a conscious effort to be what you desire to be. Not to surrender to the random opinions of minimum-minded people, not to surrender to the history of your family and generational curses or generational realities, not to give in to the uh, subtle suggestions of culture. You make up in your mind who you are, what you are, what you will accomplish, and you live your life based on that. You set the standard on the thermostat. With that being said, look, I'm gonna get out of here. It was great ch uh, chatting with you guys. Again, uh, get ready. If you haven't seen the video I dropped earlier about the 60 day challenge starting on the 1st of June, we're doing a 60, 60 day holistic health, fitness, and wellness challenge. We're talking about mental health, uh, physical health, being in good physical condition, fitness. We're talking about being the best person physically, emotionally, psychologically that you can be. And we're kicking this off. It's going to be a 60-day thing. And you're taking the journey with me. This started as something I was going to do for myself. Uh, there are some things about my health and, that I'm not satisfied with. And it's things that I know I can change. And it's, it's now time to make the move uh, as I approach my 52nd birthday. And so that's my thing. I have said when I reach my 52nd second birthday, I'm going to be in the best condition that I've ever been in my life. And that's across the board, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, and physically. And so it's going to take a lot. It's going to take a lot in every area. And I'm going to share some of those things with you. Sometimes I'm going to be talking to you. I'm in the gym. Sometimes I'll be talking to you. I might be in the kitchen preparing something uh, as I shift in the way that I manage my nutritional intake and so many other things and then that's going to be a wealth of information being posted uh on two i'm using uh i'm sponsoring this through two two of my companies the visionetics institute and master fitness 21 and i'm going to be everybody in and it's not going to cost you anything to participate if you just want to come in and be a part
part of the journey. Everybody can share their journey. We're going to have all that set up where everybody can share their journey. But if you want some specific guidance, we can work that out too. And I'm going to make all of the programs that are going to be extended in this uh, affordable. Now, there's a difference between cheap and affordable. I don't do cheap. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, I want to do what I put out to have value. I want what I put out to have impact. And so, but it will be affordable. It's not something you've got to do. It's uh, something I'm offering, but it's not something I'm pushing. I'm going to say, hey, here it is. If you want it, it's going to be there. But what I do want you to do, I want you to take the challenge and then extend the challenge to 10 people. That's what I want you to do. Take the challenge, extend the challenge to 10 people, and we're going to change our lives. We're going to do it in a way that we're going to develop habitual behavior, habitual thinking, habitual practices that are going to lead to a stronger, more productive life for years to come. That's the goal. Look, I've got to get out of here. As I always say, I'm going to live my life on full so that I die on E. I challenge you to do the same thing. With that being said, I'm out. Peace.